Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and committee members. My name is Malika Anderson. Um, I am the superintendent of the Tennessee Achievement School District. Thank you for, uh, for giving me a few minutes to share with you some of the learning of the early years of the ASD here in Tennessee, um, as well as the impact that we have. Um, I'll be sure, I'll, I'll provide a few uh, comments for a few minutes, but I definitely um, want to leave sufficient time for you to ask questions. Um, and for me to answer them to the best of my ability. Um, I will start with providing some context for why the ASD exists in Tennessee, and we'll transition that to uh, the broader conversations around what it takes to be successful uh, should you implement this in, in North Carolina. Um, and my, some of this may sound familiar. I imagine some of the same circumstances exist in, in North Carolina. Uh, but here in Tennessee, there are approximately 35,000 students who are attending uh, priority schools. Um, and these are schools that are performing in the bottom 5% statewide based on proficiency. Four years ago, when we started this work, students in, in priority schools had an 80% chance of falling behind their peers every year. Parents were receiving A's and B's on their kids' uh, report cards. Uh, families and students themselves thought that uh, that they were doing fine. They were graduating from, from high school with, uh, with very little problem. But here's the harsh reality. The reality is that the average eighth grader in a priority school in Tennessee is reading on a fourth grade level. And regrettably, most schools in a priority school neighborhood are similarly low performing. So that means that absent any action, if we didn't do anything, there was a very high chance that students would go all the way from kindergarten through high school in one of the state's lowest performing schools. This concentration of low performance means that by senior year, odds were that a student graduating from a Tennessee priority school had a 4%, single digit, 4% chance of being college and career ready when they graduated based on ACT scores. The average ACT score in a Tennessee priority school is a 14, which is ridiculously low. So today, after several years of collective action and intervention, we are proud to see some early signs of progress. The majority of schools on the priority list are now receiving an intensive intervention, either through the Achievement School District or through the local district. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's newly happening. In the few short years that the ASD has been serving priority schools, average student proficiency has increased nearly 10 percentage points. And students in priority schools are growing four times faster than their statewide peers. The creation of the ASD and both the resulting external pressure of the state intervention and the draw to Tennessee, the draw to the state of significant resources and partners to support intensive school turnaround efforts across the state have spurred improvements in the schools that we are directly serving in the ASD and the ASD has been a catalyst for change in local districts that is producing substantial Substantial benefits for students across the state. We also know that test scores aren't everything. They are important and they are a, an important barometer of how students are progressing against uh, state learning standards and we obviously want those to continue to increase um, the, the longer we go and, and that's for sure. But we also want to make sure that we are changing the way in which uh, families and students engage with the learning environment, with the educational system. We expect um, not to implement this turnaround strategy at the expense of parents or, or to do it to parents or communities. We want them to be part of this. And so um, we are intentional about engaging uh, parents um, early on and consistently uh, when the schools are brought into the ASD. And one of the things that we're hearing from our parents uh, when we survey them in the middle of the year and at the end of the year is that 80% of them, uh, four out of five of our parents, consistently rate our schools in A or a B. Now, North Carolina likely faces similarly dire circumstances for your most vulnerable students. And for this reason, you're considering creating an achievement school district of your own. So let's talk about what the ASD is and what it's not, what, it, what, what you need to be successful and what I would urge you to consider as you are um, thinking about implementing such a strategy. 
while Quote State Takeover is, is growing in popularity <coughs> around the country as an option for improving low performing schools, I want to be clear that state operation is a governance model. And that alone is not a turnaround strategy. But it is a necessary, a really important condition for success that if it is coupled with other enabling factors, it can truly have the kind of impact that, that we collectively seek with the students that we're serving. First and, foremost, first and foremost, state intervention must be coupled from the beginning with capacity building of local and national operators who will ultimately own school level decisions. The role of the state is to provide strong vetting of operators on the front end and to have a performance framework coupled with school action decisions that will hold operators accountable for student achievement. This vetting and accountability system is the primary lever uh, to increase the proportion of students who are served by effective operators over time. What this means is that um, the operators are given the autonomy to determine the uh, kind of programmatic staffing, use of funds, use of time needs that their unique school community requires. All too often, um, the, the failures that we're seeing in the schools that have happened over decades um, are because uh, school districts are set up to serve lots of students across large geographies with very different needs by neighborhood and by background. And because districts necessarily need to be efficient, there is a, ten a tendency to create systems that, that both teach to the middle, manage to the middle, and create mediocrity, and then in the worst case, failure that we don't see them, as students just kind of falling through the cracks. And so we think that as a, uh, because of kind of systemic mediocrity and, and teaching towards the middle of creating failure, we have to implement something that's on the other side of the spectrum that creates greater autonomy for schools uh, via their operators to make decisions about what is in the best interest of the students that they are serving uh, with a great deal of autonomy from the central office which is why um, the, the ASD has, has, uh, has pursued this kind of portfolio strategy in the way that we have, where we are freeing the schools from, um, from the local governance while increasing, increasing uh, local decision making and, um, and autonomous actions that are reflective of the, the unique needs of the students that we're serving. Also critical to this work is collective commitment. Prioritizing, addressing this long-term, seemingly intractable problem um, has to be at the forefront of legislator, funder, and community consciousness before engaging in something as long-term, complicated, multifaceted, and resource-intensive as an achievement school district. Policy conditions are critical for setting the foundation for this work to take hold and for attracting high quality operators to serve low performing schools. Policies such as favorable charter laws, collective bargaining laws, expanded credentialing options for leaders and teachers, etc. The funding community must be deeply representative of community priorities and generous over many years to support startup and maintenance of operators and the local school district as appropriate as they build up systems to meet the unique and challenging needs of the students that I was talking about before. The work will take both funding and reallocation of funding as significant changes are made um, over time. It also takes sustained community engagement, both hyper-local community engagement of families and parents as well as efforts to get broader community input related to policy decisions and practices that impact the availability of quality educational options. Success requires access to effective service providers around special education, instructional supports, wraparound services, um, and wraparound supports for parents and families. Um, facilities development is also, or has been in Tennessee, a key issue uh, because schools that have been underperforming for as many years as our schools um, have been are also commonly under-resourced and investments in facilities um, have been lagging um, such that the quality of the facilities, um, in order to get them to the level that we need them to be, just to reflect the priority that we are placing on the students in the building, requires uh, significant investment. Ultimately, these three conditions for success, coupled with the systemic governance change, uh, such as uh, the state 
um, operation of, of individual schools is necessary for this work to be successful. Undertaking the creation of a state intervention effort such as the Achievement School District has great promise and it should not be taken uh, lightly. Which brings us back to where we started. We are saying that it is unacceptable. It is not acceptable for so many of our students to languish in failing schools. If North Carolina is anything like Tennessee, we have to recognize that we all played some part in creating the systemic conditions for the failure that we've allowed our students to, to languish in. And so we all have a responsibility to contribute to driving towards its success. And that includes making very substantive, long-term changes in the way that school is delivered so that our kids can have better learning outcomes. With that, I'll answer any questions that you have about how the ASD is operating or, or any questions you might have about uh, what, what else we might have learned. Thanks, Malika. That was uh, very helpful. Um, if you have questions, we <clears throat> raise your hand so I can, um, and maybe, Craig, why don't you come on up and we'll let you start. I've got a couple myself, but um, uh, one of the reps is, sorry, sorry, Malika, we're having to walk up to use the, the, the mic that we've got up here. So I actually can't hear the person speaking. We might have to, when you ask a okay. question, we might have to have a person closest to the speaker. Yeah. Okay, how, is this better? That's perfect. Uh, okay, perfect. great. Uh, I'm sorry, hold on one second. Okay, I did have a question it, it, uh, from one of our reps. If we have, if we can get your comments um, in some written form. Oh, absolutely. That'd be, that'd be I, great. I have to forward, yeah. Okay, thank you. And uh, Representative Craig Warren is coming up to ask a question right now. Good morning, Malika, and thank you very much for your presentation. Appreciate it a lot. I, I really would like some, some you to flesh out this funding community. You, you emphasized how important it was to have them invested, not just with their money, but with their hearts and minds as well. And how did you attract these funders? How do you respond to them? Uh, what type of commitment, length of time? Uh, amount of money, whatever you can do to fill in the blanks on on uh, the funding community involvement. I appreciate that. Sure. So, so you know the, the ASD is statewide and we're concentrated um, in Memphis. Most of the priority schools that, um, that are eligible for the Achievement School District and that we've brought into the Achievement School District, district over the first three years um, are, are in Memphis. And so we really focused our initial year's efforts on building coalitions with uh, with Memphis, with local uh, funders, um, and then kind of coupled that with national funders. So depending upon the, the, the distribution of the schools in North Carolina that, that you're serving, uh, there will need to be some attention to um, connecting with the, the funders that are closest to those schools and have a best interest in, you know, in them uh, improving. Uh, but I, I will say that it, because the um, scope of the of the turnaround, both the services, the, the resources necessary for the, the vast community engagement, the uh, facilities investment, it, it's a pretty significant kind of community investment that um, that we found that it was it was better um, better to identify three or five committed local providers who will who will work together to fund uh, kind of joint priorities of the school district and the ASD um, and then to couple that with national funders as opposed to identifying a single funder who will will bear the the entire burden of the of the expense and I, and I think that that reflects what I said earlier and that is that this this really is, is best communicated and um, and supported as a community priority. Like this is this is not just the state and legislators who know that this is important, and, and not just individual parents you know who know this is important. But building this as this is important for our community, our neighborhood, our city. You know, in each of the cities that this is that this is impacted, and that we are we are asking for everyone 
to lock arms and contribute something. And so to that end, we are asking every, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not sure how many funders you have around, just around, the, you know, around the state, but you know, we're asking you know, these three to five funders to, um, to band together and provide appropriate uh, support for the work that's happening in this city. And then we would, then what we did was we selected a national, uh, three national funders that would convene local funders from across the state to um, to basically serve as a harbor master, uh, you know, to, to make sure that that uh, where there were additional resources needed in, in various areas, we could share across the state. And we, and you were asking about the actual amount. Um, we have commitments of 100 million um, over five years from um, from the co the entire collection of, of funders. Oh, and a follow up, Malik, if you don't mind, um, has to do with with the facilities. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you needed to upgrade these facilities to to make them welcoming and and reflective of the commitment to the kids. But I'm curious about how how did you handle bringing these facilities um, into the folds, uh, so to speak, in, with regard to the fact that that these buildings were built with. Uh, I know, and I don't know how you do that in in Tennessee, but here that's a local commitment to, and and then you're going to take over a building, facilities, <coughs> maintenance. Uh, what's the pushback, and what's the sort of the the model you use to convince uh, or or to respond to um, to the to the taxpayer about yeah. I'm going to take these schools out of your district and put them into a separate district. You're not going to That's a great them. question. That, we thought long and hard about that one because that's a sticky issue. Uh, I'm glad that you raised it. The, uh, the memorandum of agreement that we have, that the ASC has with each of the local districts that we, as we say, co-locate uh, within a city is that the day-to-day -day maintenance um, waxing the floors and repainting and things like that, that is the responsibility of the ASD or the operator that we placed in the school. Capital repairs, those are the responsibility of the local district because our, our agreement is this. We are bringing schools into the ASD um, um, as a matter of triage. We see this very much as a short-term intensive comprehensive intervention that is going to you know, shock the, the system and, and the school communities and, and support, just not just shock, but shock and support the school communities into much higher performance um, and to prepare them to return back to the local district. So we are building the capacity of the local, dis of the local district to receive those schools again when they are higher performing. And from that perspective, actual ownership of the building, the facility doesn't change hands from the local district to the state. The, the uh, building is retained, the, um, I'm sorry, the local school district retains ownership of the building throughout the entire process. And while we are essentially in the building serving the students for the five or 10 years, depending on how long it takes to get it to the right performance level, we are responsible for upkeep and so forth, but the local district is responsible for uh, capital repairs. And to that regard, we partner with them to help bring resources because we want the school, the, the school building, to be, as you said, reflective of the, of the um, um, value that we place in the students that we are serving. Uh, last follow-up. Uh, I keep uh, turning to my chairman to make sure I'm not over overplaying my hand here. Uh, See, so, this is actually a, you said it, it's a somewhat short-term uh, turnaround measure and then the schools would return back to the, the local LEA, whatever it might be. So how do you or do you involve the local LEA insofar as once this, this you turned around the school, so to speak. <coughs> What's to prevent that school from going right back to where it was in the first place? Because you've taken it out of the mix, now you're gonna put it back in the mix. Uh, how do you work that angle of it? And with that, I'm gonna go sit down. Thanks for that question. That, that's actually a question that we are grappling with right now. As I said, we're in early years of this and we haven't yet transitioned the school back 
to the local district. Um, our state law says that after at least five years, um, and um, if the school has been off the priority list for two years in a row, that we will build, uh, develop a transition plan that over two years, the school will then uh, be prepared to return back to, uh, to the local district. That is for the schools that we directly manage. Um, and so we are just now, given that we are in year four right now, um, of operating our first cohort of schools, from school, school year 12-13, we are in the process of developing those transition criteria. So in, in my mind, um, there, there would be some criteria that we're using to define when the school is ready to return that is based on both the the, tra both the, tra the trajectory and maintenance of higher performance of, of the school that's in the ASD and ready to go back. And then secondly, some criteria um, for the school district, the local school district, to receive it. Uh, because, as you said, we've made some, we will have made some very major changes, inclusive of autonomy and uh, for decision making and there are some additional uh, budgeting resources there um there are significantly more um support services for families the hours um in, in probably 75 percent of our schools have an extra hour or so a day and so what we will do is work with the local school district to um to both share what it has taken to improve the performance of our schools or, or a particular school that makes ready to return. And then to identify here are non-negotiables in order for this to continue, they need this to, you know, to be successful or else three years from now, the school can come back out of the local district and into ASD and that's not, we don't want this merry-go-round of priority schools. Um, and so while we don't have it yet defined what those criteria are for return, um, uh, in terms of what the local LEA needs to do differently, that is exactly what we are thinking about and are doing it in collaboration with the district. <clears throat> Thanks, Malika. Um, I've got a question, and, and please let raise your hand for Kevin if you have another question for Malika. I know we're going to be sensitive to to your time and, and probably have about five minutes more. Um, I wanted to ask, um, uh, well, let me ask my first question is, I know with some of the different charter operators you've had come in, um, I'm sure you've seen, uh, I'd be interested to know some of the numbers of your most successful charters and maybe what you think differentiates them from some of the charters that you've had that, that haven't been quite as successful as those. Sure, so so we had a, um, a three-pronged strategy around around charter operator development, so selecting ones that would be, uh, that we thought would be successful. Um, and that was to identify local um, charters who were already in existence in, um, in the cities that we're serving and um, invite them to apply in, in this very new realm of, of school turnaround. They only, they had to meet our performance standards. Any operator that was um, already operating schools had to have evidence that they were serving a, a similar demographic of students, both in terms of initial low performance, um, ethnicity, and income, and that their uh, performance growth exceeded the state. So that was a minimum bar to even ask existing operators to apply uh, to us. And so we identified local operators who, were, um, who met those criteria, and we also identified national operators that uh, that met that criteria and invited them to apply and bring um, their regional resources uh, to the to the state. And then we also partnered with a charter incubator to um, to open up the opportunity for experienced educators and and, and other um, um, educational entrepreneurs to develop the ability to run charter schools. And so it, through through those three, I have pop ups on my screen. <laughs> Just a second, there we go. Um, so those three ways we identified. Uh, uh, what we thought would be potentially successful operators in this turnaround environment. And what we're seeing um, is, is a couple of things. One, that it's the first year of operations for 90 or 85 percent or so of our operators. Uh, the performance is, it, it is un unpredictable. Uh, it is up and down first year, and, and we and we expect that, and so we don't uh, we don't hold them accountable for the first year's performance. We expect them to because they are completely 
the stripping away um, so much of what wasn't working and rebuilding everything from the bottom up um, in terms of culture, higher expectations, uh, new teachers, administrators, uh, curriculum instruction, supports, you know, pa pa parent communication. First year is very much a building year. And so for just about everyone, we didn't see um, strong performance um, in the first year. What we did see is that by year three, our um, uh, all but one of our operators uh, had the highest growth rating in the state possible. Um, and so we know that it takes time. We also know, that's so one thing for, for everyone, for all the operators, we also found that in the early years, operators that phased in grades, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, with the fact that, that operators can either uh, convert the whole school all at once, meaning all grades all at once, or um, can do one grade or two or three or four grades at a time, depending upon what their, what their capacity is. And we found that in the early years, the operators that phased in grades were more successful than those that, uh, that took all grades in the school at the same time. Um, and then, by year, I mean, we're in our fourth year right now, and we're seeing the, I'm not sure if you can, can you still see me on the video? Because I'm making hand motions. <laughs> we can. <laughs> that might be yeah. helpful. Okay, so we were, you know, so we were seeing, you know, the phase in kind of went like this, uh, really, really high. The, the, school, the <clears throat> operators that were doing um, a whole school turnaround, it was pretty steady here, and they started to converge like this. And so, you know, by year three or four, phase in versus whole school turnaround doesn't seem to be um, that big of a, of a differentiator. Um, the final thing that, I, that I'll, I'll, I'll state is that um, the operators that had uh, very strong back office support, that back office supports for, um, for curriculum and instruction, and this is, it may not be obvious, but we have to be pretty important, but also uh, uh, community engagement. They were able to do two things that, that it took others longer to do. They were able to more quickly adapt to the varying uh, needs of the students that came in every year. And turnaround situations with a pretty high mobility and, and you'll have a different kind of crop of students with a different uh, mix of needs each year. And, it, and if the operator had a very strong back office around curriculum and intervention support, they were able to take that data around this new group of students, new proportion of students, and quickly adjust their, um, their instructional models to meet those unique needs. If they did not have that, and they had to kind of uh, connect with another operator or with an external consultant or whatever the case may be, it just took longer for that kind of adjustment to happen. Um, and then the second thing, that if, if the back office included resources that were focused on community engagement, uh, family um, uh, communications, information, et cetera, they faced less uh, pushback in the early years. And that pushback in the early years can be very distracting to, uh, to increase performance. So the degree to which they really invested in those kinds of relationship uh, building efforts early on um, they were able to avoid some of the, the political pitfalls and distractions uh, from the, the core work of actually improving student learning. Thanks, we got it. And, and, so, and, and, and the last thing I'll say, our, our top operators, we, we're seeing, a, you know, uh, one of our, our schools went from bottom 5% um, in its first year to, it was in the, it's in the top 50th percentile and after its second year. That kind of jump is possible, and um, and we're seeing that at this point, I believe we're at seventy six percent of our operators are meeting expectations, and they're on track in terms of growth and achievement towards our, our overall goals. We we know that this work um, is possible, that we can change the outcomes for students if we are brave enough and thoughtful enough about. Um, all the kind of interconnected implementation criteria that are necessary for this to be successful. We'd love to get the name of that operator and their phone number. Um, <laughs> I have another. Uh, we don't take our operators. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question from uh, Representative Turner. Good morning. Uh, as you prepare for the transition back to the local schools, what kind of factors are you seeing emerge that would have to be dealt with in the local schools? Forgive me, I'm not quite sure 
is how much autonomy is provided to uh, principals and, and you know, regional superintendents around uh, the use of their uh, deciding which curriculum they'll use or which uh, learning interventions for reading or math and how long the school day is and, um, and, and who's making staffing decisions or is the district force placing um, uh, staff or can or do principals have complete control over that in our in our in our charter schools all of that is all of that decision making around program staff and budget is the decision of the operator and the schools it's not the school district the ASD is not making those decisions we are holding them accountable for results and so um, I, I expect to include in our transition criteria that that level of flexibility that, that made it possible for the schools to adjust to the needs of students that they're serving remain um, and so that, that kind of principal autonomy or some kind of network autonomy, you know, would be would be necessary. Um, we also, I don't think I mentioned this before, but it's an important one to note. When we bring schools into the ASD, and we can we either directly manage them or we charter or, or contract manage them. And uh, most of our schools are charter managed. We uh, of our 29 schools, five are district managed, uh, you know, that we directly do ourselves, and the remaining are, are charter operated. And so when we return the schools to their local LEA, if we have chartered them, they return as charter schools um, here in Tennessee. That's something that you know you, you all would need to, to figure out um, from maybe that's already in your legislation. But that is a pretty significant um, condition for return of the school. And that is what um, codifies in a governance structure the autonomy that the school was, was granted to achieve its goals. Um, and I think that's probably the most important thing to uh, to continue. Uh, thank you, Maliki. I'm going to give you the last question. We appreciate. I know you have um, taken time out of your busy schedule, and, and I greatly <coughs> appreciate it. Um, you guys are really pioneers. Um, I mean, you know, New Orleans had, uh, you know, with the recovery school district, some similar uh, things going on. But you're really pioneers uh, on the ASD. Is there anything? Um, you know, looking back at the past, you know, number of years, you would say um, are things to think about, or that you would have thought about differently. Just sort of any any reflections on things to pay particular attention to if you're a new state looking at doing an achievement school district. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have, we've definitely. Uh, worked closely with uh, New Orleans to learn uh, as much as we could about how they implemented their recovery school district, uh, as you said, under different circumstances. Um, and, and they went kind of whole hog with, uh, with the charter district and that the intention is to, is to be kind of, um, at this point, entirely uh, charter run. And they, were, they had lots of learnings that we decided that we were not going to repeat. <laughs>
Um, it was very much, you know, we want to be transparent, give information to parents so they can make, you know, good decisions about where their whether where their kids go to school. Um, and that, and we were also building something from scratch that took all of our all of our mental energy to do that. We are we are now in a place where um, we're set that the singular focus about getting information out versus having systems to um, collaboratively uh, solicit uh, community input, not just family, families and parents, but, but certainly uh, families and parents as part of it, but uh, legislators and, uh, and, and neighborhood leaders and business leaders getting their input into our decision making. Um, that is what will make the community um, see this as their effort, not just the state coming in and doing it to them. And, and so given that that is the, um, we were turning the corner, I think, uh, right now in, in that regard. Um, and so we'll be in a much better place in a year or two from now when there, when we have that, that, that track record of, of true, authentic community engagement that is around um, uh, lifting up parent and community voice and, and, and agency and self-advocacy to inform education policy. Like that, I think, is the place where this is going to go that will make it such that parents will demand that their local schools are higher performing, that they will not allow themselves to be uninformed about how their schools are doing, as is often the case. And I imagine probably in North Carolina, many parents that don't know that their schools are as well performing as they, as they are. Um, and I just wish that we had done that Based earlier. what she just was talking about. Um, I think we are out of time. I did have one, we, Representative Horn just asked me one final question that um, uh, may, maybe he, he may, to do, or he may, may have him do some follow-up on with you, but was, I assume this was Tennessee passed legislation. Was, was the legislation, um, you know, where, where was it, where do you feel like it was driven from? I mean, was there local efforts that were engaged and wanted to do this or, you know, what 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 was some of the background cause of the legislation going through? Yeah. So before the before the legislation was passed, uh, we had received Tennessee had received an F rating from I, I can't remember the name of the organization, um, but it's, it's a it's a national organization that assesses the validity of the learning standards in a state and. Um, we received an F, and what that meant was that we were telling our, uh, you know, our parent, our parents and students that, yep, yep you're proficient on our on our state exam, uh, but the rigor of our standards at the time was so low that that proficiency rating was relatively meaningless. And when we received that F, and it was a very public, embarrassing black eye, uh, you know, for, for for the state, it started to raise questions that. Um, that the governor at the time needed to uh, needed to answer. The legislature was called on the carpet um, uh, for it. The state board of ed was called on the carpet. And so there was a, uh, and then parents were were, were um, for the first time asking questions about what does that mean? What is what you know? What does it mean that that the state was given um, an F in terms of quote truth in advertising regarding the our learning standards and and, and grades? What did that mean for my child? And because there was so there was such a public black eye around the state of education in Tennessee, there was um, there was great interest across the board in both uh, telling the truth to each other, being very honest about where we stand, and um, and no longer wanting to be uh, compared to the you know some of the bottom performing um, states in the country. And that, that's exactly where we were. We were only above Mississippi for, for a little while. And that was just, that was just not tenable any longer. And so um, it really, the, the impetus for the ASD legislation uh, came from um, the governor at the time, the, the governor and the legislature worked really closely together on it. Um, at the time there was a, it was interesting, it was a, a, a Democratic governor, a, a Republican majority uh, Congress or, or General Assembly, um, now we have a Republican governor um, and, and majority Republican um, uh, General Assembly, and it was and from the very beginning a very bipartisan um, effort to get this legislation passed uh, for the benefit of the state as a whole. Um, but but sure, the governor played a, played a very big role in it.